Politiekfilosoof Michael Sandel is een van de populairste hoogleraren van de Amerikaanse Universiteit Harvard. Zijn collegezalen die puilen uit en niet alleen in de Verenigde Staten. Want al decennia lang waarschuwt hij voor de fnuikende gevolgen van het neoliberalisme en het uiteenvallen van gemeenschapszin. We zijn volgens Sandel op een gevaarlijk punt aanbeland waarin het vertrouwen in de elite is verdampt. Dinsdag dan ontvangt hij een eredoctoraat aan de Radboud Universiteit in Nijmegen. En deze week verschijnt ook een herziene editie van zijn boek Het Onbehagen in de Democratie. Michael Sandel, welkom to Buitenhof. Uh, Good to be with you. Thanks a million for coming. First of all, uh, this book in Dutch, The Tyranny van de Verdienste. You write in it that you are very uneasy about democracy now, that the situation is acute. How so? Because there's, we've seen a backlash in democracies around the world against governing elites that reflect a lack of trust. And it's an understandable, legitimate lack of trust because these elite mainstream parties for four decades have promoted a version of neoliberal globalization that heaped rewards on those on top, but left large portions of the population struggling. And so it's no surprise that, well, especially from 2016, we saw a backlash against elites, and it now threatens the future of democracy. Are you only talking about the United States, or is this happening in many democracies, also here in the Netherlands? Well, it's happening certainly in many democracies. Uh, we see figures like Marine Le Pen in France, the uh, alternative for Deutschland in Germany, gaining support, channeling these grievances. In the Netherlands, I've read recently about the success of the Farmers' Party, which also, it seems to me, uh, watching as an outsider, uh, seems to me another expression of the backlash against elites who are seen to be by farmers and working people as unresponsive, not listening. So you are not surprised that this farmers party, BBB in the uh, Netherlands, um, that they were so successful because they had a historic victory. We have never seen anything like it. You are not surprised by that at all. Well, it's consistent with what we're seeing in many other countries, the rise of a version of right-wing populism that taps into grievances, anger, resentment, frustration against governing elites, against but, the political right. establishment. But those sentiments are authentic. They are real. Yes. So uh, who's to blame for this? Well, it's a complicated picture because those grievances, uh, some are ugly and nasty with Trump, for example, he appealed to racist, xenophobic sentiments. But, and we tend to dismiss him and his supporters, thinking it's only about racism and xenophobia. Mm -hmm. But there are legitimate grievances entangled with these ugly sentiments. And the legitimate grievances, we had better find a way to address. Those are about rising inequality not only of income and wealth, mm -hmm. but also inequality of social recognition and esteem for working people, people who do not have university degrees or professional credentials. Right. Now, we have been talking just now with the president of the Dutch bank, a banker. We had a huge banking crisis in 2008. And now again, in your country, banks are failing. There are bank runs. What does this do with uh, the credibility of banks for the majority of the people. It further erodes the legitimacy of banks and the financial industry generally. This is one of the strands of grievance that, in my view, is legitimate. After the 2008 financial crisis, there was a bailout of the banks that essentially made the shareholders and the people who had created the crisis uh, basically saved them put the system back together again, while ordinary uh, homeowners who, who had lost their homes, they were left struggling to pay the bill, and facing the, austerity. And taxpayers, uh, as they do now, they pay again for the failing of Silicon Valley Bank, but also here in Europe, uh, Credit Suisse. The governments are bailing these banks out. 
and you would wonder why. Is it, it's, it's a normal company. Why would it be saved all the time, every time, by governments? The rationale offered, and there is some force to this, is that these, some of these banks are too big to fail, that mm. there would be systemic risk, that the system would melt down. But it's as if the taxpayers and ordinary citizens are being held hostage to a system where finance has such a disproportionate power over the economy and also uh, over politics that they are able to force these bailouts. And that generates legitimate anger. After the bailout following the 2008 crisis in the United States, there was anger on, that fueled movements on, on the left with the Occupy movement and Bernie Sanders' mm -hmm. surprising strength, and also on the right, the Tea Party movement and ultimately the election of Trump. And this anger and resentment, partly to the bailing out of, of banks, continues to shadow democracy as a, because it creates mistrust. Yes. Other example, we just talked to the worldwide director of the World Nature Fund. Right. And um, she says, listen, climate change is a very important topic and we are losing biodiversity. Yeah. What we see in the Netherlands is that some people say, listen, there is so much money reserved to fight this problem, I can even pay my energy bill. Yeah. What is the problem there from your perspective? Well, I think that she's right. I agree with her about the urgency of dealing with climate change. Mm -hmm. The question is how to go about it. Now, it certainly does require massive public investment. There's no question about that. But we're at a kind of political impasse over climate change because it won't work. I don't think it will work simply to have a top-down solution. Here are the investments, here are the regulations, here are the new taxes. Without listening to and engaging in discussion, deliberation with the communities and the working people whose lives will be transformed by the transition to a green economy. But are you saying that politicians are not explaining what they are doing and why this issue is so important? It's partly that they're not explaining it, but it isn't only a matter of explaining better. In fact, often politicians and scientists say, if only you understood the science better, you would agree with us. Yeah. That's a kind of preaching. Uh, that, that, that you don't understand the science, you're ignorant. I think that's a recipe for failure beyond explaining. Politicians and political parties and social movements need to speak to and listen to people working in the fossil fuel industry, people whose jobs will be lost, farmers, to see if they can be included in deliberating about how to solve this problem. Very clear. The, the, the other book that you wrote also, uh, very interesting, the tyranny of merit, what has become of common good. In it you write that education as an engine of social mobility has fueled resentment and contributed to the rise of populists like Trump. Now, I always thought that education is key for a healthy, happy, clever society. You say the opposite. Why? Well, not exactly the opposite. I agree that education is key to a healthy society. I spent my career in university. I'm, I'm all for education. But. but presenting education as the solution to inequalities of income, wealth, and social esteem, that's the mistake. Individual upward mobility through higher education is not enough to contend with the structural inequalities that the age of market-driven globalization has produced. That's my argument. President Obama said when he was in charge, here in, here in America, you can make it if you try. You don't like that sentence, why not? First of all, just as a descriptive matter, it's not true. Social mobility in the United States, we used to say here in America, it's mm. always possible to rise, whereas in Europe, people are stuck in the class of their birth. It turns out, that the chances for intergenerational mobility in the United States are less than they are in many European countries, certainly the Northern European Scandinavian countries, but somewhat less than they are in the Netherlands. But building a response to inequality that says, 
You can make it if you try as an individual. You go get a university degree. Then you might be able to rise. That's not enough to deal with the inequalities of income and esteem and respect that rightly frustrate so many people. The, and if I could just add, yes. it's a mistake. We, we forget with those slogans, we forget that the majority of our fellow citizens do not have a university degree. Over 60% in the United States and in the Netherlands do not have a university degree. So it's folly mm. to create an economy that sets as a necessary condition of a decent life and dignified work a university degree that most people can don't have. So you're talking about this myth that you can get it you can be rich, successful, yeah. if you just work hard enough, as Obama said. And you have been telling this story also, uh, very critical about uh, neoliberalism, yeah. for 30 years now. And now, lately, people are listening. One of the people who listened is the German Chancellor, Olaf Scholz. Mm. He read your book, this one, and then he said, I want to get in contact with that guy because he has an important message. Right. Why, what did he want to hear from you? Because you talk to each other. We did. He, we had a dialogue. It was actually during his campaign, mm -hmm. during the recent campaign. And we talked about how uh, many working people are angry and resentment and have turned away from social democratic parties, which he was le uh, leading, because of a sense that elites were looking down on them, a kind of credentialist prejudice. And so we talked about an alternative political project that instead of arming people for meritocratic competition, go get a university degree mm -hmm. and then don't worry about inequality because you will rise, and focused instead on the dignity of work, how to, uh, to renew a sense of respect and honor and social recognition and pay for those who perform essential work make essential contributions, but who may not have a university diploma? Well, and he made, he made this, as it turns out, a theme of his campaign. And he won. And he won. Yeah. Now, interestingly enough, uh, you have two sons, right? Yes. Your wife and one of your sons is also working at Harvard. Yes. Uh, so you are from this very intellectual family. Yes. You could say you are a representative of the elite. How do you get your information from the people that you are now talking about? How do you avoid preaching right. to a group that you have no contact with whatsoever? Well, I wouldn't say I have no contact whatsoever because outside of my mm -hmm. classrooms and outside of what I do in the university, I do travel a lot and speak to public audiences. Admittedly, many of them students. have university degrees <laughs> yeah. and many of them are students, but it's, it's a fair question. I think one of, part of what's missing in our politics is we've lost the art of listening. And by listening, I don't just mean hearing the words that others speak. We, we've lost the ability to listen for the, the moral principles and concerns lying behind people's uh, convictions and the disagreements we have. One of the reasons we're so deeply polarized, I think, is that we don't listen to one another. We've lost the art of democratic public discourse. We have mainly shouting matches, partisan shouting matches, and it's reinforced by social media, which feeds us news and opinions we already agree with. Are you the ambassador of debate? Ambassador of debate, well, I'll accept that <laughs> title, Vaughn. I like that. Uh, I, what I try to encourage uh, not only in my students, but also more broadly in our civic life, is a more morally robust, engaged kind of public discourse than the kind we become accustomed to. A purely technocratic politics is unsatisfying because it doesn't address the big ethical questions people care about, and the shouting matches um, are no solution either. So we really have to build a better kind of public discourse, a public discourse of engagement, of moral argument, where we can reason together in public about big questions despite our differences. 
I think that's a very good end for this broadcast today in Buitenhof. And uh, hopefully politicians and everybody are listening to what you had to say about this topic. Uh, Michael Sandel, thank you so much for coming to Buitenhof. Thank you so much. Bedankt voor het kijken. Vond je dit een goed gesprek? Vergeet dan niet te abonneren. Een like of een reactie achterlaten kan natuurlijk ook. Of bekijk een van de andere interviews op dit kanaal.